So as you may know, I am in the middle of a long-term Debian review, and I've actually just installed it on my main machine as my main distro. Previously, I was just using it on my alternative hard drive, but because of the recent Linux troubles that I've been having, you'll know what I talk about if I if you watched the podcast yesterday, I decided I'm just going to go full on Debian and see how it goes. I've been there for about 12, 14 hours now. It's so far been so good, but uh, Debian was actually working really well on the alternative hard drive and on my other laptops, so I'm not all that surprised. But what I wanted to do today was talk about 10 things that you should know if you are thinking about using Debian as your main operating system. So I think these are, are important things to kind of keep in mind if you're thinking about switching to Debian. Before we jump in, if you would possibly leave a like on this video, I'd really appreciate it. It really does help the channel. So let's go ahead and jump into the 10 things you should know if you're considering Debian. So first of all, this applies to all versions of Debian. I didn't kind of narrow this down to just bookworm it you know really this is just Debian as a broad distribution no matter what version so the first one is that installing Debian is as hard or as easy as you want it to be so in the past I have talked about the troubles with finding ISOs on their website now this is no longer a big deal because the initial or the ISO that they link to on their website on the front page does now include the non-free firmware which was always the hard part when it comes to finding the ISO uh, on Debian so they fixed that that's good is no longer a big deal but really what I'm talking about when it comes to this point is not even the ISO itself but more the process of installing Ubuntu. There are many different ways of installing Ubuntu. There's a Calamari's installer that you can use. There's an Encurs or there's actually a couple different Encurs installers that you can use. Uh, and how those installers work, what options you have during installation depends on which installer you use. So if you're a more new user type person, if you're, you've never used Debian before or you're new to Linux and you want to, you can use the Calamari's installer. It's very easy to use. It's just a few steps. And especially if you've installed Linux before, you won't have a big deal with that. If you want more options and you're more technologically minded, you can use the more advanced expert installers and those gives you more options and they allow you to customize your install much more than the Calamari's one does. So installing Debian is as easy or as hard as you want it to be. The second thing that you should know going into a Debian install or using Debian is that software availability really isn't an issue. The Debian repositories are huge, like really, really big. Maybe one of the largest repositories of any Linux distribution out there. They have a ton of software available to you. The issue that you'll have to keep in mind, especially if you're using regular plain old vanilla Debian stable, is that the version numbers are what's going to get you here. So if you are a developer of some kind or you're using more esoteric software that relies on libraries that maybe are more up to date, you may have some issues when it comes to software availability simply because Debian out of the box without making some tweaks, especially if, again, if you're using stable, relies on more tested software. I'm not going to call it old software. It relies on more tested, more established software. And that can be a problem when you're looking for specific versions of software. And really what it comes, what it comes down to is in, in the place where you'll probably notice the, this the most is when you're trying to install again, more esoteric software, things that rely on libraries and, and like Python and Perl and a whole bunch of like the, the programming languages, maybe that uh, get updated quite frequently. If you install software that relies on those libraries, you may find that those libraries are too old for some of the software that you're trying to install. But there are many ways of working past this. You can you can deal with backports, which we'll talk about later. You can switch to testing, which will have newer software still. Uh, if, if you're looking for more like a binary package or a, or a container package, you could use Flatpak, which again we'll talk about later. So. Uh, really, software availability, it doesn't have anything to do with the number of packages that are available, but more to do with what is available in terms of versions and stuff like that. So the next one on the list is a one that kind of makes Debian really good f for me. So Nala is a great front end for apt. So I've talked about Nala before in a video. I'll try to link that in the cards above or in the video description. 
and uh, basically what it does is it just makes apt so much better it makes it faster it makes it more visually appealing it makes the syntax a little bit better there's just so many things about nala that are really really good and now with bookworm it's actually available in the repository so you can just sudo apt install nala you'll never have to use apt again just use nala instead and it's really really good i i almost guarantee that if you use it once you'll never want to go back to using apt again so it is very very good and i highly recommend everybody use nala instead of apt so the next one kind of goes back to the software availability part that i was talking about a few a few moments ago but w during your installation especially if you're going to use the expert install enable the back porch repositories right from the beginning and while you can enable back ports post install it's actually not all that hard by enable by enabling them at the beginning during installation you have those things right from the get-go and it does save you some time and some effort later on and it means that when you're setting up your brand new installation you have access to all the software that you could possibly want no matter what version that software actually ends up being so if you're using the expert installer it gives you an option to enable backports you should definitely take that opportunity to do so uh, the next one it also has to do with the installation, actually, is that during installation, especially if you're using, again, the expert install, which I think most people probably should use. And the reason why I say that is because it does give you so many more options towards what you're doing. This particular point here regarding the installer is that I, I think everybody should choose a very good mirror. Now, when you're installing Debian, it gives you a list of mirrors where you can pull software repositories from and all of those are in different parts of the world and the further away they are from you the slower that mirror is going to be right that's usually the way things work not always the case but you know sometimes you can get one that's really close and be slow sometimes you get one that's really far away and then it's a little bit faster but it's usually the case that the closer the mirror is the faster it's going to be so during installation make sure you choose the closest mirror to your to where you're located and you'll be surprised at how fast apt and nala actually end up being because the one thing uh, maybe it's possible that because i was on open for the last couple of weeks that i just got so used to zipper being slow that apt seems like really really fast but i have noticed that apt with the proper mirror just is just so much faster than basically any other package manager out there even pac-man has some slowness to it not so much anymore but you know, it, there at times Pac-Man can be pretty slow. Apt so far, as long as you choose the right mirror, is pretty fast. And and again, that's something that's way easier to do when you're installing Debian than post-install. It doesn't mean you can't do it afterwards. It's just a little bit easier during the installation. The next thing to keep in mind is that Debian by default, especially the stable version, uses Firefox ESR as the Firefox version for your installation now this is not going to matter to a lot of people but it is something that you should keep in mind if you need the absolute latest and greatest version of firefox some people do need that for corporate regulations for so software and security patches to be able to visit certain websites that require more up-to-date versions of firefox because the esr does not get updated very often now it does get security updates and such like that so you should be mostly fine but it is something to keep in mind going into it that they do use the SR version and that version doesn't have all the features of the, the newer versions of Firefox. Usually not that big of a deal because the, the new features of Firefox are usually garbage. But just kind of keep that in mind as you're going in that it does use the SR. Now it is very easy to get another version of Firefox. You can install the regular most up-to-date version of Firefox or you could use the Flatpak. So speaking of Flatpaks, rely on Flatpaks a lot. So... I did say that the breadth of the Debian repositories is very large. It's, it's a very large repository, so you're not going to have a problem finding software there. But because of the version numbers, you may find situations where you want a more up-to-date application. The best way to do this, in my opinion, is to install Flatpak, get it from FlatHub. Usually that's going to mean you getting the most recent up-to-date version. And you're not going to have to worry about adding extra repositories to Debian. One of the things that people tell me all the time 
that breaks Debian is people mixing and matching repositories from different versions of Debian. You know, they're mixing and matching SID repositories. They're mixing and matching, you know, backports and all this stuff. And while I don't think the backports thing is that big of a deal, as long as you're using it, you know, responsibly, I do think that mixing and matching, you know, you know, um, different repositories from different versions of Firefox or of Debian rather, it can be an issue. Flat packs gets you beyond that. None of that stuff will matter. All that stuff is containerized, and you can just use it. You don't have to worry about breaking your install by using them. Plus, it gets you again access to that more up-to-date software. So, for uh, example, for my for my use case, I use flat packs versions of GIMP. I use flat pack versions of OBS and Audacity and Kden Live, things that I want to have completely up to date always. Now, not so much GIMP because I'm still convinced that version 3.0 is never going to come, but whatever. Uh, the rest of them, I still want to have the most recent versions available to me, and Flatpak allows me to do that. Uh, the next one is something just to keep in mind, is that if you're coming from a rolling, rolling release or even Ubuntu or something like that, be prepared for very few updates. Now, and this is especially mostly true, I should say, on the stable version of Debian. Mostly for me in the past I've used rolling release distributions or things that appear to be rolling release things like Fedora and those things get updated all the time so if you're using Arch you could update your, your system three times a day and always have up updates to do. That's just kind of the way Arch works there's always things being updated in the background you know you could go a day and have a whole like 100 150 updates to do and that could happen every single day that's just the way a rolling release works right on Debian, it's not a rolling release, not even close to a rolling release, and you do not need to update that thing every day, right? You're gonna be, you're gonna, if you if you try to update it every day, you can, but you're gonna see nothing to do, nothing to do, nothing to do. It's gonna feel boring, but that's the point of Debian. You're not going to get updates every day, so just be prepared to change your update habits, especially if you're coming from a rolling release. Be prepared to change it to once a week once a month even it probably would work just fine and that's the point of Debian it's not meant to get these this flood of updates you're just going to update it every once in a while and it will work just fine and that's the way it's supposed to be the next one is a little nerdy and, and you may not even notice this but if you are someone who installs NeoFetch and runs NeoFetch to take a screenshot of your brand new spanking rice or whatever on your system, you'll probably notice the package count on Debian is extraordinarily high right out of the box. And I'm talking about like 1,700 to 2,000, maybe even more packages on a fresh install, depending on what desktop environment you went went with. So me personally, I installed the Plasma version of Debian and I have like 2,100 packages out of the box. That's a fresh install without me having installed anything else. That is an extraordinarily high number of packages for a fresh install. But really, it's not as bad as it sounds simply because Debian and Ubuntu really count packages differently than Arch does. So if you installed the same Plasma uh, desktop environment on top of Arch with Xorg and all the stuff that you need in order to have a functioning system, you'd probably come in at around 1100. On Debian, it's closer to 2100, which is almost a thousand more. So, what's the deal, right? Well, Debian counts packages and libraries and stuff differently, and they package things differently, which causes them to, to have more packages. It's just kind of the way it works. It doesn't mean that they're different, it's just the way they count them, and also the way that they package them. So, a lot of the packages that you would see on Arch are kind of packaged together and come as just one package build, whereas on Debian, a lot of those libraries and things are separated, so they count as packages, where Whereas they'd be, you know, contained together or packaged together, I should say, uh, on Arch or in, in similar distributions. So if you see a very large package number on Debian and uh, you're not used to that, now you know why. The last one is all about the community. And I, I will be very upfront about this, that I haven't spent a lot of time in the community. But I have quite a few followers on Mastodon. I've talked to people in the forums. I've talked to people who use Debian in my Discord server, I've talked to a lot of people who use Debian, and the vast majority of them are very friendly, very, very helpful, uh, and aren't snobs at all about, you know, the fact that they use Debian. The, Debian is not known for, I use Debian, by the way, that's Arch, for sure, you're going to find many more buttholes in the Arch community than Debian, but I will say that you should be prepared for many, many outspoken Debian users, many of them who are very set in their ways 
and they have particular ways of doing things and they have expectations that you're going to do those things the exact same way as they have always done. Debian is a very old distribution. Many people have used this distribution for decades and they have a very set way of doing things and they expect, again, you to do those things exactly the way that they do. Now, again, not everybody. I'm not generalizing saying everybody that I've met is this way, but a lot of people I've, co I've come across is just they, they have a particular way of doing things. And just like with anybody who has become a fan of something, they do not necessarily like it when you criticize their distribution. That's just kind of a – that there is a generalization. People who have become a fan of a distro don't like it when someone like me that comes along who is a very much a noob and criticizes it because it doesn't do things the way I expect it to do it. So Debian is a – like I said, a very old distribution that has a mechanism for doing things in a certain way. And if you go into it expecting it to do it in a different way, you're going to feel some friction there. And if you complain about it, you're going to hear back from the Debian community about your complaints over it not doing it the way you expect and them wanting to do things the way they expect. It's, a, it's, a, it's not always a cohesive experience is the way I, I guess I'd put it. So just kind of be prepared for that. Overall, the community has been fantastic, just like I think every Linux community is. But as usual, be prepared for those prickly fellows. So those are the 10 things I think that you should keep in mind if you're going to use Debian. I'm sure I probably could have come up with a pro about 20 more or so if I thought about it for a little while lot longer, but I'll leave those for the review, which will come up here in a few weeks. So uh, if you have comments on any of this stuff, you can leave those in the comment section below. If you haven't already, if you'd leave a like on this video, I'd really appreciate it. That really does help the channel. You can follow me on Mastodon or Odyssey. Those links will be in the video description. You can support me on Patreon at patreon.com slash linuxcast. I really do appreciate everybody who does support me on Patreon. You guys are all absolutely amazing. Without you, the channel just would not be anywhere near where it is right now. So thank you so very, very much for your support. I truly do appreciate it. You guys are all awesome. I truly, like I said, just seriously, thank you so very much for your support. Thanks everybody for watching. I hope everybody's happy and safe and all that stuff. So I'll see you next time.